those who are joining us tonight. Just for one second, let me get this straight. All right, we should be able to see that. If you can see that, somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see it. All right. So this is our uh, cover. Um, and you should be able to download the outline from the church's website. And I've also dropped it in the chat a few times. So tonight we're, re we're talking about the Bible really is black history. This is lesson number 12. The Bible really is black history. Uh, I want to start by offering a friendly reminder to everybody. Uh, 2024, we are encouraging uh, everyone to begin to bring your Bibles, take your Bibles with you to church, to worship, wherever you go. And we are fortunate to have a number of persons who join this Bible study who are not members of St. Matthew. So my request to you is, no matter what church you are a member of, uh, let's go back to carrying our Bibles. Um, yes, it is very convenient to access our Bibles on our phones and on our devices, but there's just something about carrying the book, something about having the book, something about turning the pages, something about having it as you're listening to sermon, as you're listening to scripture reading, something about having the book that is very helpful. So uh, no matter what church you're a member of, our church, any other church, I'm sure your church would appreciate you carrying your Bibles with you uh, as you go, all right? So tonight I want to start uh, with something that is off topic, off topic. But last week when I taught the Bible study Wednesday night for Mount Zion AME Church, uh, I was teaching about God's glory, God's glory. And that's a phrase uh, or terms that we hear all the time in the church. We talk, talk about the glory of God. So one of our Bible study members who was on asked a question about uh, the Shekinah glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God. And those of you who've been in church environments uh, long enough, uh, we'll have heard this word Shekinah or or the Shekinah glory, right? Uh, so he asked the question and I was not prepared to answer it then because I didn't want to give him erroneous information just off the top of my head. So I told him that I would answer that question tonight at the beginning of our Bible study. So this is a little off topic, but it's still very important uh, for us to know about this word Shekinah. Uh, if you've heard this word Shekinah at any time in your church life, just put your hand up or throw your thumb up or do something. You've heard people talk about the Shekinah glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God, right? So uh, the question is, uh, what what is the Shekinah glory of God, all right? What does Shekinah mean, all right? Uh, several points I would leave you with. Number one, Shekinah is the English transliteration of a Hebrew word meaning dwelling, settling, or the one who dwells, or that which settles. So when we're talking about uh, the Shekinah glory, um, somebody do me a favor and go on the church's WhatsApp chat and put the correct meeting ID and passcode in, please. I, I think I made a mistake and I'm just not able to do that right now. So just go on the church's WhatsApp chat and put the correct meeting ID and passcode in. Thank you very much. So uh, the word Shekinah means dwelling or settling, right? Or the one who dwells or that which settles. Very interestingly, for those of you who have heard um, this word Shekinah, and when people have referenced it in their teaching and their preaching, it's very interesting, and I've made this point several times, that the word Shekinah does not appear 
in either the Old or New Testament, all right? The word Shekinah does not appear in the Old or New Testament, but the concept of Shekinah appears, all right? The concept of Shekinah appears, all right? So to further define it, uh, Shekinah is a manifestation of God's personal presence, which took the form of a cloud. So if, if, if you've even heard people talk about uh, the glory cloud, right? The glory cloud, all right? They may be referencing, uh, talking about Shekinah. And of course, this is one of those Hebrew words you know, that people can use that, uh, again, makes us sound, you know, great and biblically knowledgeable and aware and all of that. All right. So they'll talk about the Shekinah glory of God. Right. <laughs> they'll, they'll really say it in a way that, you know, is really, uh, uh, really impactful. All right. But when we're talking about Shekinah, we're talking about a manifestation of God, a manifestation of God's personal presence, right? Which took the form of a cloud, right? And, and so I, I got I to press you here a little bit to cause you to think that even though we use personal pronouns for God, even though we talk about uh, usually, usually using personal male pronouns for God. We talk about God, he, God, his, God, the father. In reality, John 4.24 reminds us that God is spirit, all right? God is spirit, right? So God, listen, is neither male nor female. All right. The Bible confirms that God just is. God is spirit. So when we're talking about the Shekinah glory of God, God's presence, God showing up in front of God's people in the form of a cloud, a cloud is neither male nor female. All right. So you know that God is, God is revealing God's self because you see this cloud. All right. Are y'all with me? It's 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 the it's the Shekinah, the presence of God, usually in the form of a cloud. All right. Now, there are several examples of this in the Bible. All right. The key passage, I think, the key passage is in Exodus chapter 19. The key passage is in Exodus chapter 19. Let me just read this quickly. It's on the outline, or if you have your Bible close to you, you can read it, all right? On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you, excuse me, will be my treasured possession. Oh, excuse me. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So verse seven. So Moses went back summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord, 
right? Watch this, verse nine. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Do you see that in verse nine, where God says, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud. That would be the Shekinah. All right. Verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. All right. So the cloud, the glory cloud, the Shekinah cloud is visible. God manifesting God's self, God revealing God's self to the people. Verse 12, put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them, and they washed their clothes, and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. 16, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain. That's the Shekinah and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. Hopefully you're seeing all of these examples of Shekinah. 18. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Verse 20, the Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them perish. Some of you have heard me say in several instances, several sermons, several teachings, that I'm, I'm very leery of people who say, and I know what they mean and their intentions are good, but they say things like, come on, y'all, let's usher in the presence of God. Let's reach out and touch God. Well, I don't know that that's really what we want to do, right? I know what they mean. They don't mean a bad thing. They mean well. But the truth of the matter is the Bible makes it clear that no one, no human can see God. No human can touch God and barely be in God's presence and live. In fact, in this very book of Exodus, uh, you, you may see it a little bit later, God says to Moses, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock so that when I pass by, you won't be able to look at me. Because anybody basically who looked at God uh, got taken out. All right. Verse 21, the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai 
because you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you, but the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them, all right? So this graphic right here, if you can see it, this is a depiction of possibly what the Shekinah glory cloud would look like. You see the people down at the foot of the mountain, right? And this cloud and lightning and all that, thunder and all that is symbolic of the presence of God, all right? So this is the Shekinah. Remember what I said earlier, the word Shekinah does not appear in the Bible, not in the Old or New Testament, all right? But the concept of Shekinah appears, all right? So what I give you on the outline are several other examples and places where the concept appears. Exodus 40, 38. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all of the Israelites during their travels. And you can read the rest of these. Numbers 9, 15, 1 Kings 8, 10 to 11. Even in the New Testament, Luke chapter 2, verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. All right. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth, all right? So that's, that's the concept of Shekinah. Whenever we're talking about Shekinah or the Shekinah glory of God, we're talking about a visible manifestation of God's presence, all right? Letter E, a related and important concept to Shekinah is the word theophany, theophany. Say that right where you are, theophany, theophany, all right? Has a similar definition, a visible appearance of God to human beings, right? And uh, one of the uh, best places to, to see a example of a theophany is Exodus chapter 3, verses one through six. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up, hence, Moses and the burning bush. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, watch, God called to him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. All right. So the burning bush that was burning but did not burn up is an example of what's called a theophany. All right. It is another symbolic presence of God in really a uh, means and a, and a way that humans can accept it, all right? So the, the bottom line to this whole piece on Shekinah is whenever we're talking about the glory cloud, whatever people want to call it, the Shekinah glory of God, it is God dwelling among and with God's people. That's what Shekinah is all about, all right? So, so it's very strange sometimes for us to talk about, quote unquote, giving God glory. I, I went into this in a little detail last week that uh, glory has several definitions, 
all right? But the, the essence of glory for many of us is we ascribe praise and adoration to God. We radiate God, all right? We, we exalt God, right? We, we magnify God, all right? We, we give God glory is our way of acknowledging God, all right? And expressing who God is, all right? So uh, that's a question that came up in the Bible study uh, last week. And uh, I wanted to make sure I covered that uh, even though it's a little bit off topic, I wanted to cover it uh, to make sure that uh, it, it is an important concept that all of us need to be aware of. Before I move to this next section, any questions about any of that? Any questions about any of that? <clears throat> all right. Again, a term maybe that you've heard uh, over the years, a term that has existed uh, in your uh, minds, uh, you've heard people talk about uh, the Shekinah glory of God descending, right? You've heard people talk about that, right? But but I don't know that I've heard a lot of people really explain <laughs> what, what the Shekinah glory is, right? Uh, and, and it's very important for me uh, that you are able to uh, know what it is, all right? Now, back on topic. All right, I'm on page four of the outline. So in chapter seven, uh, what our author does is really make the point, uh, basically, it's just kind of a, a little commentary chapter, basically, um, uh, where he, he just confirms the fact that the Bible uh, really is Black history. Now, last week I had asked you at the end of the study, uh, what were your thoughts? How did you feel about the information? Uh, uh, some of you gave some remarks in the study. Some of you sent me some text messages and emails about your thoughts and feelings, uh, and I appreciate all of them. Uh, and I actually would love to hear more about your thinking about this study, all right, and about not not so much about the study, but about the information that we've been covering, all right. What I also realized, let it be, is that some people may be hesitant to share their feelings because of the educational and religious conditioning that we have experienced, all right. I, I've been doing this long enough to know that while we are all well, while most of us are tremendously excited about this study and learning new information, et cetera. Everybody is not excited, right? Because it really does challenge the, the normal information or norm. It, it challenges most of the information that many of us have been exposed to traditionally when it comes to Bible teaching uh, and Bible study. There, there, there have not been in the average standard Bible study in any church, black or white, you don't hear a specific focus on the historical narrative of the Bible being about black history or the blackness historically of the Bible. That's just the truth, right? It's not against anybody. It's just the truth. Right. Many of us and many of us have been in the church uh, different amounts of time. Um, some have been gone from when they were babies on the cradle. Some are newer Christians. Right. But most churches of all denominations do not make it a focal point. They do not emphasize, have not emphasized historically the blackness the African connection, the history of the Bible in this way, right? Uh, so uh, that's why some people may feel some kind of way even about being in this study. They may feel some kind of way about this information from a number of perspectives. Like number one, how come I'm just hearing about this now, <laughs> right? Some people may feel that way, you know? 
some people may may feel well that's not what mama taught me that's not what grandmama taught me that's not what old reverend so and so taught he never preached like that he never shared this information so you know don't want to necessarily come against what you think and how you feel and what you believe right but uh as i said last week we are using the Bible to teach the black history of the Bible, right? There are extra biblical resources that we reference. There are other reference materials that we uh, reference, that we utilize. But we're, we have tried to show you in the Bible what the Bible says <laughs> about black history, right? So. What the author, uh, Dr. Williams, uh, Reverend Dr. Williams says is that in chapter seven, he talks about uh, really uh, what I'm just talking about now, what's called revisionist history, right? Revisionist history. That revisionist history is just a fancy way of saying that history, biblical and otherwise, history American, African, and otherwise has been revised, right? And we have been given and are being taught and have been taught a cleaned up, sanitized, white supremacy version of history. He notes in the chapter uh, that there are several problems with revisionist history. All right. Number one, let us see number one. He says, one problem with revisionist history is that the full story about American history is not told, particularly as it relates to Native Americans. How many of us grew up in school systems where we were taught that Christopher Columbus discovered America, right? How many of us were taught that? Show of hands, thumbs up, something, all right? We were taught that Christopher Columbus discovered America, right? The part of the story they left out is, is that when Christopher Columbus got here, there was people already here. That, that's that's why they are called Native American. And he went through a nice little short history about uh, how the Native Americans had to teach the new persons who arrived how to survive the winters, how to eat, how to live. And then those people, the, the, the Native Americans were already on the land. But then the people they trained took the land. Okay, let me put it in a way you can get it. You've been working in a position for how long? The company hires somebody new, tells you to train them, and then they take your position. <laughs> that's that's the that's kind of the essence of. It. All right. So one problem with revisionist history is that the full story about American history is not told. That's, that's part of the Florida problem, right? Number two, second problem with revisionist history, the full, tour, the full story about black history and its connection to America is not told. Uh, we're getting ready to go into Black History Month, right? And I'm, and I'm sure we're going to hear all of the uh, hundreds of black inventors who, who, who created and patented items that we use, right? But, but we as a people have to intentionally dig for that. That stuff is not a part of the American story, right? That's, that's, that part is, is not told about American history. Black history is not considered American history. The contributions of Blacks in this country not considered to be a part of the American story. So revisionist history doesn't tell the full story about Black history 
and the connection of black history to America is not told. Thirdly, this thing about revisionist history, the full story of what happened is never taught to white people. That's why a lot of white people are so ignorant about black people and about black history, but they never heard it. They were never taught it. And listen, ladies and gentlemen, you can feel how you want to feel about it, but it is my opinion, my considered opinion, my personal opinion, that white people need to know about black history. White people need to know the contributions of blacks to this world and to this country. All right. But when you teach a revised version of, of uh, American history, a revised version of black history. Uh, well, I, well, I was reading an article somewhere or was it in this chapter? I can't remember where uh, there are stories that don't talk about slavery. They say the slaves were workers. Right. And the whole Florida narrative is we don't want to teach black history because we don't want our children to feel bad. What kind of fracking stuff is that? All right. So revisionist history doesn't teach the full story to white people. It doesn't teach the full story to black people. That's why many of us are so enamored with this information. Go ahead, Michelle. I'm sorry, I, I I don't mean to interrupt, but when you talk about, um, you know, people think that young young people or children shouldn't learn about it, you know, back in back in the South, they had no problem taking their little kids in Klan uniforms to Klan meetings. They had no problem taking their children to watch lynchings and and carrying on. They have no problems putting our children into the fields to pick cotton. So it it's crazy to me that people think, oh, they're too young to know that. It's crazy. You're absolutely right. Uh, and that is white supremacy and white domination and white control of educational systems and education. This is the Florida example on steroids. You know, it's all in how you look at it, <laughs> you know, and the people who control the narrative. That's what I've been talking about. The people who control the narrative can control what information gets shared and what doesn't get shared. So you're absolutely correct. So white people don't know the story. Black people don't know the story. And that's what I'm referencing. Number five, economic and political systems are built on myths and inaccurate information. Folk were so twisted out, not only about Barack Obama getting elected and reelected, but they were so twisted out about him and his family living in the White House. Interestingly, they twisted out about it when Black people built the White House. A Black person laid out D.C. I mean, we could go on and on and on and on about the Black contributions. But when white supremacy and white control of economics and political systems, I just might as well go ahead and say this now instead of waiting till uh, Sunday. Um, some of y'all might remember, particularly members of St. Matthew, that I sent out an email and a message several weeks ago saying, all right, I want to start organizing us to prepare for the upcoming election season. I want us to start being intentional about registering to vote. I need some people to Let's come together, get our social action agenda together because we need to prep our communities for this upcoming election in November. Do you know I did not get one response? Not a one. <laughs> not one. 
Not one person said, all right, pastor, let me know what we need to do. Not one. And I don't know if you're watching the same news and information that I'm watching right through here. But one thing I know is that we better ramp it up quickly. We can't wait till September, October talking about let's rally around the community and do this, that, and the third. That stuff needs to happen now. And I'll tell you why in a minute. All right. So he lays out the problems, let us see, with revisionist history. And when there's an absence of teaching, there's an absence of information, right? He then, section three, gives what I think is a very excellent summary of the biblical story. If you ever wanted to kind of summarize what the whole Bible is about, he, he does it on page 126. All right. And he basically asks the question and lays out information on what is the Bible. All right. And this might be a question that some of you even had. What is the Bible? All right. He says, the author says that the Bible is a record of a people's struggle to settle into and control a small 10,200 square mile strip of land, which they believe God promised them. So this whole land piece is about the size of the state of Massachusetts. All right. The Bible is a story of people of African descent who love their God and desire to follow his will, but they often fail. And even though they fail, God desires to have a relationship with them. That's the story of the Bible. The Bible is a story of a people who were created by God. These people moved through the wilderness under Moses into the promised land with Joshua. They were divided into 12 tribes and those 12 tribes were scattered about around Canaan. The people were brought together under a monarchy led by Saul, David, and Solomon. And what I would ask you to do in terms of some extra study, because you hear these words all the time too. You hear them on the news, you hear them on talk shows and all that, right? I want you all to research these words. Research the difference between monarchy, dictatorship, autocracy, oligarchy, theocracy, fascism, and totalitarianism. As aware people, in any political structure who live in any country, we need to know the difference between these words. Dictatorship, autocracy, monarchy, oligarchy, theocracy. You always The news always talks about Russian oligarchs, right? Well, who are they? What's an oligarchy? Fascism. People in politics are accused of being fascists. I should, have, I should have added socialism, right? Totalitarianism. We as aware people need to be aware and knowledgeable because there are countries in the world that utilize these systems and structures of government. We need to know the difference, all right? Going back to the biblical story. So there was the monarchy under Saul, David, and Solomon. But then Israel was split into the north and the south. Godly and ungodly kings reigned in Judah and Jerusalem. The Israelites were deported to Israel and Babylon. All right, that should say deported from Israel uh, uh, to Babylon. That's what it should say. They were deported to Babylon. All right, they were put in exile. That's the exilic information. After their release from Babylon, they returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt the walls. That's the story of Nehemiah. The prophets, major and minor, pleaded with the people to renew their allegiance to Yahweh, to God. So that's, that's basically the Old Testament story. 
Then we have what's called the intertestamental period. The time between the end of the Old Testament, beginning of the New Testament. That's called the intertestamental period when God was silent for about 400 years. All right. Uh, he notes that there's a shift from faith being interwoven with life mm -hmm. to faith becoming optional almost by the time we get to the New Testament. So whereas every, everything and everybody basically in the Old Testament made life decisions based on their relationship with God, that changed somewhat by the time we get to the New Testament people. You know, it, it, and it's almost like how people even treat their relationship with the church now. I'm trying not to go here because this, this drives me absolutely nuts, right? A lot, a, a lot of people see their presence, participation, membership, engagement with the church, whatever church you're a member of, a lot of us see it as optional. For many of us, the church ain't important. The church is there when we need it, but we don't have a we don't have a passion for the church. Many of us don't. We don't have a passion for God. The church doesn't matter to us. It's not important to us until it's important to us. Church is not important till you need me to write you a letter, or until you need a, me to make a phone call for you. That's when the church is important. I've had to tell some people in my 42 years of ministry, how you how 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 do you get even the nerve to call me to ask to write you a letter about your involvement in the church and you ain't here? What you want me to do? Lie? And but people don't feel no kind of way about the church. All right. Let me leave that alone before I, before I see this fast thing done caused me to have a little bit more energy. All right. So if you, if you read the, the, the biblical story, right, the New Testament is a story of colonization and control by Rome. Rome were colonizers. Right. A lot of what happened politically, and this is good timing because we're getting ready to go into Lent. Right. Uh, Rome was in charge of what was going on in the New Testament. What happened to Jesus was a Roman process of execution, all right? And the Romans and the Jews had a loose agreement that the Romans would allow the Jews to practice their religion as long as they paid render unto Caesar. That's Roman. Remember, render unto Caesar what Caesar's. All right. So, so Rome became colonizers of Israel. And I gave you uh, a list of countries where colonialism uh, is, uh, has been practiced. Uh, countries that try to control other countries, even now. All right. In the New Testament, the synagogue emerged as a place of worship and study. The rabbis emerged as important religious and political figures. That's a kind of a shift from what we read in the Old Testament. Jesus is born, of course, in the New Testament. And here's a point. Here's a point. The church was born after Jesus was born. Listen, listen to what Jesus told Peter. He says, on you, I will build my church. So, so technically, there was no institution known as the church until after Jesus died. So the church had its birth on that particular day of Pentecost, noted in Acts chapter two. I say that particular day because Pentecost happened every year, the Feast of Weeks. So that particular day of Pentecost is when the church was born. And from Acts two forward, 
is when you start hearing about the church. Acts 2 forward. That's what Paul's role was, to travel all over the place, setting up what? The church. So this, he, he, he does this in chapter seven, right? This is, if you ever wanted to know really uh, what the Bible was all about in summary form, now, I mean, there's a lot of details not missing, but here are, you know, 12 or 13, 15 points that kind of summarize what the Bible is all about from cover to cover. It's a record of what happened to people. All right. Now, he says one more thing, and then I'll open it up for comments and questions. He makes a major statement, I think, on page 127. He says the Israelis who now, today, 2024, occupy the land of the Bible are not to be confused with the Israelites who descended from the loins of Abraham. The biblical children of Israel no longer live in the promised land. And if you want to have an argument with some of your Jewish friends, you tell them this, and they may not speak to you ever again. Because part of the issue that is happening today and folk will accuse us of being anti-Semitic, they accuse us of being all those things, which we are not, is that the Jews of today are claiming that they are the same Jews of the time of the Bible. And the author says that is not true. And when he did his presentation before us, he started to kind of go into it he references it in the book in a couple of areas, and it certainly requires us to have some additional uh, discussion and uh, some additional teaching. So having said that, uh, for next week, please read chapter eight. If you have not uh, signed up or if you're considering signing up for uh, the Bible is Black History Institute. The link is on the outline. And again, I want us to think about uh, our next area, our next subject of study. Uh, uh, the truth of the matter is um, the Bible studies that we are doing now, if, if we really want to dig deeper and go deeper, they are going to challenge us in every single way. Challenge our thinking, challenge our history, challenge what we know, challenge what we think we know. But it, it requires us, I think, to have an openness to learning. And you don't have to agree with it. Uh, one of the things that works for us, and it might work for you, is if you make the commitment that you want to be a lifelong learner, right? Being a lifelong learner doesn't mean you agree with everything you learn, but you sure enough better know it, right? You better know it. Uh, and that that is what allows us to be conversant in conversations and in subjects that actually matter and that we can make uh, intelligent statements about you don't have to feel like you have to know every single thing about a subject, but at the very least, uh, being a lifelong learner, uh, particularly in this area, when it comes to the Bible, right? Many of us have been in the organized church. And one of the main responsibilities of the church, ladies and gentlemen, one of the main responsibilities of the pastor is to teach, right? That's, that's my responsibility, to teach. I was telling somebody yesterday, you know, they were commenting about, you know, some of our Bible studies and things. And they were saying, you know, you know, I don't know how you do it. And da, 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 da. I said, well, you know, it's, it's not easy. This, 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 this little one hour that I spend with you takes me five or six hours to prepare for. Right. Because I don't want it to be raggedy. Right. You know, I could easily say, 
Well, the Holy Spirit will give you revelation. You just read it and let the Spirit of God speak to your heart. You know, look, you've you've had enough of that. You've had enough of that in your lifetime. Let's let's dig deep. Let's dig deep. Let's take the time we need to dig deep into these scriptures and create, listen, create a different kind of perspective and expand our biblical horizons, right? Some of you have been running here and here and here and here and here, and that's why you're not that's not why you're not retaining anything because you're getting it from too many places. Now, I'm not saying you got to stay with me, but wherever you go to get your teaching from, it needs to be consistent. Whether you stay with me or not, whether you stay with St. Matthew or not, go somewhere where there is depth, right? Where there is, where there is content, not just form, but content that we can dig into so that we can get understanding. That's what, that's what Proverbs says. And all you're getting, get understanding. You can have a whole lot of Bible, be able to quote a whole lot of scriptures, be able to reference this, that, and other, and don't know squat, right? <laughs> don't understand anything, all right? So, so getting understanding of whatever information we're studying uh, is critical. I'm not fussing at you. I'm just saying I I, I want to make I, I I wanna I wanna I wanna help develop a passion in us for biblical study, for biblical information. Right? We want to know this stuff, right? So that when the challenges of life come, y'all know what? I'll close with this. So when I was preaching last Sunday. I made reference, I think, during the invitation, I made reference to the fact that uh, I might preach a sermon very soon called How to Change God's Mind. Y'all remember I said that Sunday? How to Change God's Mind. Uh as I started kind of reading and researching and doing some, putting some biblical things together, if and when I finally preach that sermon, you're going to be very surprised at what I say. <laughs> you're going to be very surprised at what I say. I know what you think I'm going to say. You think that I'm going to lay out the process, the one, two, three of what we have to do to change God's mind. I will just give you a heads up preview that that is not what I'm going to do because, because the very foundational statement will change the whole approach to the sermon. But that requires prayer, reflection, study. It requires, you know, spending some time and even uh, uh, reconsidering some of the beliefs and statements that we have made and that we have heard, right? So chapter seven was all about, I see it kind of as a summary uh, of the validity of why the Bible is black history. And as you are continuing to feel and process this, you know, I don't know whether you believe it or not, accept it or not, you know, I don't know what you're thinking, but, uh, it is information that I think is valid for us to consider, all right? So let me stop there and ask if there are any uh, comments, questions, um, any statements uh, that anybody uh, would like to make about anything we've discussed tonight, anything we've shared tonight. Comments or questions? Pastor, this is Mother Rose. Yes, Mother. 
I would just like to say I am thoroughly excited about this teachings you're giving, and I I appreciate it because I know I was never taught all what I'm learning now from this uh, Black History uh, Bible is Black History because I know I never knew all the things that you taught us. Uh, you know, about blacks in the Bible and all of that. And I, I thoroughly appreciate it. And I do want to continue to learn more about the Bible. And thank you so much for your insight into this and your teaching. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mother. We love you. Now, Mother Rose, who 91, can say that she's open to learning something new I'm sure all of yeah. us can. God bless you. Sister, Sister Leroy, you trying to uh, chime in? Your, there you go. <laughs> no, it went off. It keeps going off. Uh, and something, something is happening where you, you keep going back on mute. Okay, Pastor. This is really new to me. But it's interesting to learn more about the history of Blacks in the Bible. I am really, really appreciate you for teaching, for starting to teach this in Bible because it's very interesting and I would like to learn more. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you got a bad connection. You? We made it out. We made it out. You sound like my mother talking about this here Bible. Go ahead, Sister Carol Johnson. <laughs> um, Pastor, I really don't think we will ever hear uh, a Caucasian um, minister preaching about the Blacks in the Bible because they've been just as indoctrinated as we have with you know the white blue eyed blonde hair and they're not going to be willing to admit that they you know everything started from blacks because then that would make them take a, take a step back and saying well am i part black you know understand what i'm saying so they don't want to be associated with the idea that they might have originated from African Americans back in the day. So I doubt very seriously whether they're going to step up to the plate. Some, a few have made comments and like the, the uh, minister that we you had on one of the other uh, Bible studies, but the majority of them, they're not going to admit it. I mean, I probably won't see it in my lifetime if they ever do. It, it would be a, Sister Carol, it would be a rare, uh, non-black person it would be a mm -hmm. rare non-black person who would ever teach bible this way right uh, extremely rare extremely rare mm -hmm. uh, yet some of the research and archaeology that has been found to support this information has been found by white people the the issue is we should why why would you know the 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 oppressor is not going to willingly liberate the oppressed right so right. they so, may have, go ahead i'm sorry i think i'm sorry to cut you off i think they may have found it but you won't find them preaching about it to their oh, congregation very very rare very rare right. and and those who have ventured particularly in congregations that may be multicultural diverse, those who have ventured to use this line of teaching and preaching usually don't last in those places long. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's just the truth about it. Right. Well, right. it's just the truth. Mm -hmm. Just the truth. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Comments, questions, statements? All right. So next Tuesday, we are back. Uh, please read chapter eight and we uh, will continue our study. So again, we're moving towards the end now. 
please give some thought to what subject, uh, what area of study we want to go to after this. We're going to conclude this in February uh, during Black History Month. Uh, you will notice that I have not dwelt a lot on the questions in the handbook. So you should be looking at those questions that follow each chapter in the handbook uh, so that uh, as we get towards the end, uh, you will be able, uh, you should be able to answer all of those questions or at least have a response to them. Uh, I, uh, my presentations and, and teaching style tends to be more of a monologue than a dialogue but I'm hoping you are taking what I'm saying and processing it. All this talking don't mean nothing if you don't have comprehension, all right? And, and, and it takes comprehension and application. That's why those questions exist, all right? Comprehension and application. This is open book test, all right? So you should be able to go and connect the questions with the answers with the information between both books, all right? So this is about expanding our biblical knowledge uh, and expanding our cultural knowledge and deepening our spiritual knowledge uh, and keeping the information as we move forward, right? Keeping the information as we move forward and developing, listen, a different perspective on this word. The bottom line is all these people that went through stuff in the Bible, all these stories, those are kinfolk. But many of us have lived long enough to know that, you know, um, your kinfolk ain't your skin folk all the time. All right. We've lived long enough to know that. All right. So God bless you. Thank you so much for joining. If you have the outline, I put a couple of flyers at the end. Uh, I put the preachers for the uh, joint Lenten services uh, that will begin Ash Wednesday. I'm preaching Ash Wednesday for the Newark District. All the services are online. Uh, seven last words will be in person at St. Matthew on Friday, March the 29th. And then we have uh, COVID testing and vaccines this Friday from one to six. The last thing I know you want to hear, however, humor me and at least come and get a test. Because again, th these provisions are numbers based, right? If, if we only have five or 10 people getting a test, guess what's going to happen in a month or two? <laughs> we ain't going to be having testing no more, all right? Because, you know, they're, they're, you know, my famous phrase to everybody is, just because it's free to you don't mean it's free. All right. So somebody's paying for it somewhere. All right. So we got to even learn to make the connections between stuff. Just because just because we get it free don't mean it's free. Since Paulette, you got something to say? Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, the RSV that I asked you about, uh, we're going to be getting it. They have not responded to me yet uh, with whether or not uh, they have RSV. I'll check again tomorrow. All righty. Thank you, sir. All right. Reverend MJ, can you play us out, please? Yes, sir. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again this evening for time spent learning more about the Bible, learning no, more about what it means to be Black in the Bible, Lord, making the connection between what happened long time ago and what's happening now. Lord, we just thank you for the teaching of our pastor, Lord. We thank you for the the members who come out to learn more, Lord, and you open up our minds and our hearts, Lord, to just be, to absorb everything that we're learning, Lord. Now, Lord, help us to, to share at least with one person, share what we're learning, Lord, so that somebody else can get this knowledge. Lord, thank you for this night. Lord, bless us as we go into prayer, prayer service at 930. And Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Love you much. Prayer line tonight at 930. Amen. God bless. Take care. Thanks, Pastor. Pastor.